Hello, and welcome to Shakespeare in Context with Claire. Before I dive into this video, I should tell you why I think context is important. My view is that the work has more meaning when you know about the context, the culture at the time, and the life of the author. I think that we have a stronger emotional connection with the characters if we can relate them to real people. This might not be true for everyone, but I much prefer a film or a movie which is based on true events. What about the character of Hero? Is the author relating a tale of a real woman who has been wrongly accused of infidelity? We will get into that later. I think that sources and dates are important for context. But if you find dates tedious and want to find out more about the characters and stories behind them, skip ahead. So, without further ado, let's start with some dates. The first reference to Mr Shakespeare in the Stationer's Register was for this play, registered on the 23rd of August 1600. It had previously been entered on the 4th of August with a note to be stayed. It was printed in quarto in 1600 and then next in the first folio 1623 with little change. The first reference to performance was in 1613, although by the time of publication it had been sundry times played. A play named History of Ariodante and Genovara was played before Queen Elizabeth on February 12, 1583, Shrove Tuesday. These are the characters from the source book Orlando Furioso by Ariosto, which was in the library of William Cecil, Lord Burley. Will Kemp left the Lord Chamberlain's men before 1599. As the quarter edition lists his name, it's widely assumed the play was written before this date. The character of Dogberry suited the acting style of Will Kemp, suggesting that Shakespeare was not only writing about friends and associates, he was also writing for them. The stories related in the play suggest a date shortly after 1581. The earliest source for the main plot, that of Hero and Claudio, is the ancient Greek novel Chiraeus and Calero by Chariton. This was a popular story that went through many retellings, the most prominent of these being the Italian epic poem Ariosto's Orlando Furioso. Orlando Furioso was translated by Queen Elizabeth's witty godson, John Harrington, who invented the flushing toilet. The story was also represented in the form of a play by Luigi Pasquacualigo called Il Fidele, for which the English translation was attributed to Edward de Vere's secretary, Anthony Monday, in 1584. Perhaps the closest version to Shakespeare's is Badello's novella set in Messina. The names and small town society is similar. Translated into French by Belforet, there is no known English translation till much later. The courtly social interactions follow Castiglione's Il Libro del Cortegiano, the Book of the Courtier, was translated to English by William Cecil's brother-in-law, Thomas Hobie. The 1571 Latin translation by Bartholomew Clark was commissioned by and contained a prefatory epistle by Edward de Vere. The fidelity of women and the fickleness of fortune could be drawn from Euphio's The Anatomy of Wit by Edward de Vere's other secretary, John Lilly. Much of the dialogue of Beatrice and Benedict and Benedict's monologues are in the euphuistic style. Mondays, Dele and Fortunio and Lily's Endymion, 1591, contain comic interceptions by the watch. I want to point out to you that work by Monday and Lily are not necessarily sources for Shakespeare, but probably the reverse or a collaboration. Jonathan Bate and Claire McKern 
have recognised the similarities between the final scene of Much Ado and the ancient Greek drama Alcestis by Euripides. The source material La Prima Part de la Novelle by Matteo Bondello of 1554 was set in Messina. Messina, a wealthy city with a natural harbour, was busy with trading vessels. The mulberry trees growing there provided a rich source of food for the silkworms, providing the silks for Hero's wedding dress. The messenger brings a letter to Leonardo, the governor of Messino, the Don Pedro of Aragon, was due to arrive in Messina that night. The messenger says that he was not three leagues off when I left him. A league was a unit of measurement equivalent to three miles. Commonly used throughout Europe, the Spanish League was abolished by Philip II of Spain in 1568. In 1570, a fleet of the Holy League gathered off the coast of Messina. The fleet, commanded by Don John of Austria, King Philip of Spain's illegitimate half-brother, won a major victory over the Ottoman fleet at the Battle of Lepanto. The three powers of the Holy League, Venice, the Papal States and the Spanish Empire, are represented in the foreground in this 1572 fresco by Giorgio Vasari, with the order of battle of the two fleets in the background. At the Battle of Lepanto, a combined Christian force crushed the Ottoman navy. These paintings occupy a prominent position in the Vatican Museum, Rome. After the battle, Don Jean returned to Messina. In 1571, the Senate decided to erect a statue of him. The gilted bronze statue by Andrea Calamesh was dedicated in 1572. Don Jean holds the three-pronged baton to signify his command of the Triple Alliance of the Holy League. Also to return to Messina was Miguel de Cervantes, who spent six months recovering after being wounded in the battle. Cervantes was garrisoned in Naples. Edward de Vere was in Naples around this time. Is it possible that Cervantes witnessed the Earl of Oxford challenge the great Don Jean to a tournament? Edward Webb reports on the exploits of the Earl of Oxford during his time in Italy. That he offered to fight any challengers with whatever weapon. One thing did greatly comfort me, which I saw long since in Sicilia, in the city of Palermo. A thing worthy of memory, with the right honourable, the Earl of Oxford, a famous man of chivalry, at what time he travelled into foreign countries, being then personally present, made there a challenge against all manner of persons whatsoever, and at all manner of weapons, as tournaments, barriers with horse and armour, to fight a combat with any whatsoever in the defence of his prince and country, for which he was highly commended, and yet no man durst be so hardy to encounter with him, so that all Italy over, he is acknowledged the only chevalier and nobleman of England. This title they give unto him as nobly deserved. Webb's accounts do tend to be rather fanciful. Even though he said he was present to witness this, he was probably a galley slave at the time. He did, however, later travel through the places that De Vere travelled, so he may have heard some tales about the Lord Oxford. The tales of Don Quixote reflect Cervantes' time serving under Don Jean. Is it possible that the Earl of Oxford might have been inspiration for the slightly ridiculous and swashbuckling character of Don Quixote? Let's get back to the characters in Much Ado, particularly that of Benedict. I think this is your daughter. Her mother had many times told me so. Were you in doubt, sir, that you asked her? Signor Benedict, no. For then you were a child. Did you get the joke? 
It took me a while, so let me spell it out. Leonardo knows that Signor Benedict is a rogue. But he can be secure in the knowledge that his wife was true, because Benedict would have been too young. Ah, get it now? Don Pedro implies that Leonardo has an excess that he cannot be trusted around married women. This is confirmed later by Benedict himself, who was afraid that were he to get married, he would expose himself to cackledry. He seems familiar with unfaithful married women. In time, savage bull doth bear the yoke is taken from Thomas Watson's collection of sonnets. In time the bull is brought to wear the yoke. Hecatompathia, published in 1582, was dedicated to the Earl of Oxford with the words, Your honour had willingly vouchsafed the acceptance of this work. Your lordship, with some like king, had already perused. Hecatompathia contained a variety of woodblock prints, including the first known use of the Cayley Greyhound, discussed in my video on the Tempest, which I will link in the comments. The device used on the front page of the 1600 publication of Much Ado can also be found in the Hecatompathia under Sonnet 6. The almost identical phrase, In time the savage bull sustains the yoke, is also used in the anonymous Spanish tragedy of 1587. The bullhorn joke then transforms for one of horns of cuckoldry to a horny young bachelor in Venice. The bull pun could refer to Oxford, the name Ox being interchangeable with bull, emptying his quiver in Venice. Genevieve Carlton suggests that one in four women in Venice in the 1500s were sex workers. Although this definition may have been quite broad, ranging from unmarried women who had more than one partner to those who accepted gifts from men. Oxford was reported to have been entertained by courtesans whilst in Venice. In 1587, Stephen Pole described his neighbours in Venice. I may repute myself highly fortunate, for I am lodged among a great number of signorias, Isabella Bellocia in the next house on my right hand, and Virginia Padona, that, that honoureth all our nation for my lord of Oxford's sake, is my neighbour on the left side. Whilst he was enjoying the company of courtesans in Venice, gossip was raging at home that his wife was carrying another man's child. More about this later. Nay, if Cupid have not spent all his quiver in Venice, thou wilt quake for this shortly. I will look for an earthquake too, then. De Vere's servant, Thomas Churchyard, reported how the earthquake in 1580 affected playgoers at the London theatres. A number being at the theatre and the curtain at Hollywell, beholding the plays, was so shaken especially those that stood in the highest rooms and standings, that they were not a little dismayed, considering that they could no way shift for themselves, unless they would by leaping hazard their lives or limbs, as some did indeed, leaping from the lower standings. The theatre, for some great regard, that open will should note, was shake so sore that sundry they, a fear frightening got. The play Much Ado About Nothing, possibly pronounced Much Ado About Noting, is a series of overheard conversations and gossip. Although set in Messina, it provides a commentary of life at court, where lords and ladies hang around with nothing to do but gossip. Why, he is the prince's jester, a very dull fool. Only his gift is in devising impossible slanders. None but libertines delight in him, and the commendation is not in his wit, but in his villainy, for he both pleases men and ang angers them. Edward de Vere 
was known to have such wit as to have people surrounding him in fits of laughter, even those who hated him, commented on his ability to make everyone laugh. He was reported to tell tall tales. His outrageous verbiage was difficult to stop. From the descriptions given, I imagine him like Robin Williams, whose improvisational and imitation skills were hilarious. Edward de Vere was a favourite of the Queen, who referred to herself as a prince, and de Vere was certainly no dull fool. But de Vere had his darker moments. Even though outwardly merry, inwardly he was apt to do himself wrong, and was not as merry as his reputation. I am not as I seem to be, for when I smile, I am not glad. A thrall, although you count me free, I, most in mirth, most pensive sad, I smile to shade my bitter spite. This is a poem written by de Vere when he was a young man. The characters of Beatrice and Hero could be representations of Edward de Vere's mistress Anne Vavasour and his poor abandoned wife Anne. Beautiful, witty Anne Vavasour was brought to the court as a gentlewoman of the bedchamber in 1580. By 1581 she was pregnant with Oxford's son. She and Edward were banished from court. In 1590 she married a sea captain named John Finch. Around two years after her marriage she settled down to live with Sir Henry Lee. To regain the Queen's favour, Henry Lee put on a lavish entertainment for Elizabeth at his Ditchley estate during the Queen's progress. The royal party was led around the gardens to be met with knights who in their folly were incapacitated by being in love with inconsistent women. It seems that Benedict, while protesting against the inconsistency of women, was not immune to love and would have fitted well into this pageant. While still married to Finch, Anne had a child with Sir Henry Lee. After Sir Henry died, she married John Richardson, but she was charged with bigamy when her first husband, John Finch, reappeared. Oh, heavens! Oh, heavens. Who, was Who was the first that bred in me this fever? fever. The, 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 the. Who was the Who first that gave the wound whose fear I wear forever? The, the, the. What tyrant, what tyrant cupid, 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 to my harm who sits thy golden quiver? What sight I first caught this heart, and can from bondage it deliver? Edward de Vere grew up in the household of William Cecil, Lord Burley. One of the perks of bringing a ward of court into the household that you can try and marry a daughter off to a titled earl. To Edward de Vere, Anne Cecil would have been like a little sister. Initially refusing to marry her due to her rank, Queen Elizabeth elevated William Cecil and gave him the title Lord Burley. Edward could not refuse the marriage contract. After marriage, he unshiverously let slip to the Queen and court and courtiers that as far as he was concerned, she was still a maid. When she became pregnant, prior to Oxford leaving for Italy, a request was made to a physician by Anne for an abortive, which was sent with a letter to the Earl of Oxford. While in Italy, Oxford received the news that he had a daughter. Although he wrote a letter to Lord Burley expressing pleasure at the news, he was slow to return home. Eventually, on the return home, a retainer, Edward York, told Oxford that there were rumours and gossip at court that the child was not his. When he landed back in England, he refused to see Anne. He was angry not so much that his wife had sired a child that he didn't claim as his own, but that it was gossiped about court that he was a cuckold. The Arden Shakespeare introduction to Much Ado About Nothing says, for Benedict, the fear of such horns lies in their power to make a man visible. His fears of cuckoldry take the form 
of fear of becoming a spectacle. Oxford was angry at William Cecil's handling of the matter. Oxford, as a teenager, expressed a fear of shame and infamy in a poem. My sprites, my heart, my wit and force in deep distress are drowned. The only loss of my good name is of these, grief, these griefs the ground. This was published in the Paradise of Dainty Devices. Oxford refused to see his wife for five years until a reconciliation was arranged in the presence of the Queen. Edward then accepted his eldest daughter as his own. He and Anne went on to have two more daughters. He seems to make an apology to his wife Anne in the portrayal of an innocent and falsely accused hero. Anne was devoted to her husband and was described as virtuous and honourable at the time of her death in 1588. Other plays that I have covered in this series seem to all be connected to a 1580-1581 date, possibly written at the time of de Vere's time under arrest. In them he seems to lampoon characters at court. This play seems to be more about him, his loves and fears, his infatuation for an inconsistent woman, and the guilt he feels for the ill-treatment of his wife. This would suggest that the play was written after 1581. It is possible that a history of Ariodante and Genovora, played before the Queen Elizabeth on February the 12th, 1583, is much ado about nothing under a different name. Hero is getting ready for her wedding, helped by her maid Margaret. Beatrice enters, claiming that she has a cold. They tease her that she is lovesick. Margaret says, Well, and you be not turned Turk. There's no more sailing by the star. Elizabeth nicknamed Oxford her Turk. As we know, the star is a prominent feature of the coat of arms. Beatrice, as if sensing a double meaning, asks, What means this fool? Margaret replies, But God sends everyone their heart's desire and to supply an allusion to Beatrice's heart's desire, Hero shows her the perfumed gloves. Oxford famously presented Queen Elizabeth gloves scented with an exotic fragrance new to the Queen. Oxford was known as the Italianate Earl. The gloves, possibly scented with Aqua della Regina, water of the Queen, an exquisite fragrance made in Florence for Queen Catherine de' Medici, the fragrance was a favourite of Queen Elizabeth. The perfume is still made today in one of the oldest pharmacies in the world, Florence's Pharmacy of Santa Maria Novella. Whether it was this particular perfume or not, it inspired a trend which lasted well into the 1590s for the perfume called the Earl of Oxford's Perfume. Trends and fashions caused a few problems in Elizabethan England. Queen Elizabeth I clearly set out what clothing was allowed for each rank in society. People could be fined for dressing above their station. In Anatomy of Abuses in England, published in 1583, the author Stubbs complained about prostitution, gambling, gaming, dancing, theatres, taverns, drinking, swearing and fashionable dress. If any have hair, which is not fair enough, than will they dye it into diverse colours, almost changing the substance into accidents by their devilish and more than thrice-cursed devices. Margaret says, I like the new tire within excellently, if the hair were thought browner, and your gowns a most rare fashion. In faith, I saw the Duchess of Milan's gown, that they praise so, Cloth of gold and cuts and laced with silver, set with pearls down sleeves, side sleeves, and skirts round and borne with bluish tinsel. But which is more vain of whatsoever their petticoats, be yet must they have kirtles, for they so call them, either of silk, velvet, 
Brogain, taffeta, satin or scarlet, bordered with guards, lace, fringe, and I cannot tell what besides, so that when they have all the, these goodly robes upon them, women seem to be the smallest part of themselves, not natural women. So far has this canker of pride eaten into the body of commonwealth, that every poor yeoman his daughter, every husbandman his daughter, and every cottager his daughter, will not flaunt it out, such gowns, petticoats, and kirtles as these. Margaret the maid has aspirations. She loves clothes and fashion, so much that she unwittingly aids in the plan for hero's downfall by dressing in her mistress's clothes. In Ariosto's Orlando Furioso, the maid Delinda dresses in her mistress's clothes and makes love to Polnesso, her mistress betrothed. Ario Dante sees the two lovers and mistakes the maid for his love. When Leonardo and Claudio sees Margaret in the moonlight with Baraccio, they are fooled by her dress into believing it is Hero. Margaret's lover Baraccio has no time for fashion. It is a thief, trying to keep up with and set the trends for the fashion of the day, is expensive, and fashion excesses lead to, lead to ridicule. This calls to mind the precepts in Hamlet, spoken by Polonius, for the apparel oft proclaims the man. Polonius, widely thought of as William Cecil, investigated the widespread flouting of sumptuary laws. In 1561, Cecil had applied to the magistracy in the South and West for reports on the working of the social laws, including the acts of apparel. The report of Cecil's emissary for the county of Beckenham showed a widespread laxity on the part of the justices, spread laxity on the part of the justices, and the resentment at Cecil's attempt to speed them in their duties. As for apparel, he says, Amongst poor men, there was some hope of good to be done, if it might be followed, which is begone. He followed, which is begone. He appends a list of orders for the county, made by the justices at the Queen's instance, amongst which are contained directions as to the clothing to be worn by the working classes. In February 1566, a proclamation was made. 1566, a proclamation was made that watchmen be stationed at the gates to make arrests, literally fashion police. In 1574, Elizabeth I released a new statute from Greenwich, which attempted to curb the excesses of those who couldn't afford high fashion. Excesses of those who couldn't afford high fashion. Is the watchman referring to a man who is deformed by wearing any great and monstrous hosen? Outrageous padding worn in the name of fashion, a poor man who is trying to pass himself off as a gentleman. Gentleman. I know that deformed. He has been a vile thief this seven year. He goes up and down like a gentleman. I remember his name. Fashions did, however, continue to be more outrageous, particularly to be more outrageous, particularly with the size of the ruff. In the words of the Bachada, Lord Percy, you look like a bird who swallowed a plate. Otto Kurz, in his 1945 essay titled Shakespeare and the Shaven Hercules, in the Burlington magazine for connoisseurs, seems the first to suggest that these words spoken by Baraccio describe a real object. He says, Com commentators did what they were inclined to do if they failed to understand an author. They corrected him. That Shakespeare was wrong has been taken for granted, but opinions differ to the nature of the mistake. Otto Kurz took Shakespeare's words at face value and found a series of histories from Tournai, produced at the turn of the 16th century. Tournai, at one time the capital city of Flanders, famous for the production of tapestries. Hercules was depicted, not as we imagine him today, 
or as he was depicted in Shakespeare's time, bearded and semi-naked, but clean-shaven in the fashion of the 1400s. The fashion depicted in a hundred-year-old tapestry must have amused Shakespeare, as the tapestry seen by Shakespeare was smirched and worm-eaten, it was unlikely to have survived to today. This tapestry of Hercules on Mount Olympus from the Glasgow Museum's Burrell Collection illustrates the style. In early 1574, Edward de Vere hired a ship with Lord Edward Seymour and sailed to Flanders. By the end of July, after having been recalled by Thomas Bedingfield, he was back in England. It is possible that he saw such tapestries whilst there, but there is a more likely explanation. His grandfather, John de Vere, 15th Earl of Oxford, was knighted by Henry VIII on the 25th of September in 1513 at Tournai, following the Battle of the Spurs. It is likely that the wealthy 15th Earl brought back tapestries from Tournai as souvenirs to hang on the walls of Headingham Castle. It should also be noted that Hercules is mentioned four times in this play, further connecting it to the role of Hercules in the Euripidean play Alcestis. Earl Shulman, commenting on the use of Euripidean dramaturgy in Much Ado, says that it creates a metatheatric representation of resurrection one where the audience and most of the players are aware that the heroine lives and that there is a plot to restore her honour. Claudio and Don Pedro, however, must perform the morning rites at Hero's tomb, and only then are they allowed to learn of Don John's villainous deception. In the reunion and marriage scenes in both Queen Alcestis and Hero are wearing veils when they are brought before King Admetus and Claudio. Both Admetus and Claudio are contrite, having been shamed by their willingness to sacrifice their wives, and both are required by honour to take the hands of the mysteriously veiled women before them. Only with the removal of the veils are they allowed to know their wives' true identities. None of the other accepted sources of Much Ado About Nothing includes this particular device of a veiled bride's reunion with her beloved. As far as we know, this drama was first translated into English in the 1700s, so we must assume that Shakespeare read it in the original Greek. This and the euphuistic style of Beatrice and Benedict's dialogue are further evidence of Oxford's authorship. Oxford, O, oh, naught, nothing. Do you think that this play is much ado about Oxford? The biographical hints in this play certainly seem to point to Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. But for those who deny any biographical link, there is much more evidence besides biography, as I am sure we will discover in the next one. Thank you for watching. Please check out the other videos in this series. Press like and subscribe and press the bell icon to be informed when the next video is released. As always, I would love to hear your comments. And remember, please be kind.